Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Bringing New Jersey out of the prohibition era. One of the key proposals Governor Murphy will roll out during his annual budget address next week will include updates to the state's outdated liquor license laws, which are limited to one permit for every 3,000 residents in a town. And restaurant owners pay dearly, sometimes up to seven figures for a license. Proponents like the governor argue the system unfairly shuts out business owners who can't afford the cost. But for anyone who's already shelled out the cash to own a permit, this debate is not up for discussion. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was with Governor Murphy today as he tried to shore up support. It's crucial because we lost a lot of um, diners coming in, uh, you know, and um, it doesn't seem like they're really coming back. The owner of Prutai Restaurant in Clinton badly wants a liquor license to boost his revenues, which the pandemic cut in half. He figures serving cold beer and wine with spicy meals could rescue the 80-seat eatery. But this tiny town of 2700's got no liquor licenses left to sell under Jersey's antiquated laws, which cap licenses at one per 3,000 residents. I spoke to somebody about it a while back and they said, corn, don't even try. Hundred and county is full of small communities. Yep. You've got Flemington, you've got uh, Tewksbury, you've got Highbridge. We're all small towns with small populations and we are locked out of the liquor licenses. Clinton's mayor joined a round table at Prutai where Governor Murphy again promoted his plans to update Jersey's liquor laws which date back to prohibition. The proposal would phase out the current license cap over five years and price new licenses on an affordable sliding scale. Depending on location, Jersey liquor licenses can cost more than a million dollars a pop. If you can get one, one businessman described bidding on a license in South Orange. My town has had two dormant licenses and I I actually put a bid for $600,000 for a license, and it's been crickets for six months. The fact that some of our arcane liquor laws uh, are from the Prohibition era, and that is artificially keeping out new market entrants, I think there's a disproportionate impact on uh, aspiring minority entrepreneurs and small business owners. The plan would also update regulations that restrict breweries, wineries, and distilleries from hosting events and serving meals. Having a brewery uh, give the ability to serve food just makes sense to me. This is not easy. There's no magic as to why now I would ask, why didn't we do this in the 40s? That would be my response. This is 80 or 90 years overdue. The push to reform liquor license laws got an icy reception from Jersey's beverage industry, which fears flooding the marketplace with new licenses could hurt established businesses. We understand that there's a need for licenses. We know that the downtowns need some help, and we feel that there's a way of doing it that's a more fair and equitable way, um, preserving the fair market value of the liquor licenses that are currently out there. Industry execs don't like the idea of using tax credits to reimburse current license owners, but one restaurant owner who bought a license in Elizabeth eight years ago welcomes the reforms. Now, since we have more competition, we'll bring more people into the towns and just leave the kind of like the selfish part, you know, on the side and then work together as, as a family. He said there's plenty for everybody. In Clinton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, and NJ Spotlight News. Governor Murphy will deliver his fiscal year 2024 budget address on Tuesday, February 28th at 2 p.m. in Trenton. Join us right here on NJPBS and on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. Our team will be live with all the reporting and analysis as he lays out his financial plans for the state.
One of the two men who carried out a bizarre murder-for-hire plot on a Jersey City political operative has been sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. Federal Judge John Vasquez today sentenced Bomani Africa for his role in the 2014 murder of Michael Galdieri, which the judge called one of the most unusual and heinous crimes he's ever encountered. Political consultant Sean Cattle originally hired longtime criminal George Bartsenis to carry out the murder. Bratsenis brought in Africa to help. The men were offered $15,000 for the hit job, and today a possible motive in the plot was revealed. Cattle believed Galdieri was stealing from him. All three men have pleaded guilty to their roles in the murder. Bomani Africa is already serving a federal prison sentence for an armed robbery. The murder sentence will be served simultaneously. The remaining two men are scheduled to be sentenced next month. Well, prison isn't the end of the line for six former Patterson police officers known as the Robbery Squad. The city announced today it's filing a civil lawsuit against the men who were fired and convicted after an investigation found they were targeting and stealing from Patterson residents. Well, now the city wants to recoup about half a million dollars paid to the cops while they were suspended. Mayor Andre Saya today saying this is an unprecedented move for Patterson because police contracts require cops to to stay on the payroll with benefits while criminal cases play out. In other towns, officers are often suspended without pay when charged with a crime. Five of the six police officers are currently in federal prison. An FBI probe targeting them also resulted in convictions for two other cops in 2018. Similar action could be taken against them, and still two other Patterson officers have criminal charges pending. This action today is another step towards uh, our priorities of police accountability and re rebuilding that trust between the community and the people they serve, as well as the trust between fellow officers. This week, courts in six of the state's counties entered into an unprecedented territory, suspending almost all civil and matrimonial trials because there just aren't enough judges to preside over the cases. Lawmakers today met to begin chipping away at the problem, but attorneys say it's too little too late. The judicial vacancies are denying residents their day in court. Ted Goldberg reports. No matter how they phrase it, New Jersey's lawyers are furious about the state's judicial vacancies. This is an epidemic. That is an embarrassment for our state to have that happen. And the legislature and the executive branch should be ashamed. The state has 69 vacancies on the Superior Court, stopping civil trials in several counties around the state. Attorneys like Corey Rothfort say the state government is leaving their clients in a bind by not nominating and confirming more judges in a timely manner. Many of these individuals may not be able to work. They may not have the income because of the injuries that they suffered. They may have significant um, outstanding medical bills. This affects litigants across the state of New Jersey. For example, in the matrimonial field, sometimes parties can't get divorced. That's exactly what's happening to Rakesh Malhotra. His divorce in Somerset County began in April of 2021 and he's still waiting on a trial date. It's absolutely frustrating, right? Because I have to handle my job. He has been paying support for going on two years of a four-year marriage. By the time this case is done, he may be paying for support more than they were married. Malhotra's lawyer says this divorce should have taken six months to a year since there are no children or significant assets at stake. We're dealing with somebody on the other side that has absolutely no incentive to settle. I was expecting that this would be resolved quickly. Lisa Crystal retired from the Superior Court last year, and her spot hasn't been filled. Retired judges like her can offer a temporary solution. There are many retired Superior Court judges, such as myself, that are now doing mediations and arbitrations. I can work with the parties on predicting what might happen if they went to court and try to bring the parties together to a solution that they can live with. We don't want to see you can't uh, go through certain types of procedures uh, because we don't have enough capacity. Governor Phil Murphy says he's working on it. Like other state leaders, he says the state's vetting process is partly to blame for the delay in getting judges nominated and confirmed. You've got to go out and work with folks to get the names. They have to be vetted. 
they have to be nominated and then they have to go through the Senate process. We have an outstanding relationship with the Senate, but we've nominated uh, a, a goodly amount. I think they try to be as thorough as possible, both the governor's office and the committee, and I think that's tied into it. I think COVID over the years and not using COVID as an excuse, I think is also tied in. Today, the state Senate Judiciary Committee finally heard from new nominees and judges who could be reappointed to the Superior Court. I thank God because there were days during the last six and a half years, especially during the pandemic, when I did not think that this day would come. So I am grateful, I am thankful, and I'm honored to be here. The last six and a half years have been the most rewarding time of my life. Senator Brian Stack says the full Senate will give them a hearing on Monday, and he expects to fill about eight of the 69 vacancies on the state's Superior Court. A small step on the path of getting New Jersey's pending cases back on the docket. In Trenton, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. Also at the State House today, another pressing issue addressing the youth mental health crisis. Recent reports find 10 percent of New Jersey's children have been struggling with anxiety, depression and other mental health issues since the start of the pandemic. A CDC study just released unveiled teen girls in particular are experiencing record high levels of sadness, violence and trauma. A raft of bills is moving through Trenton that policymakers hope will make a difference. Raven Santana has the story. I'm here to support Bill's legislation and envisions of something different. Advocate Al Therese Frazier is just one of about a dozen people who testified in front of the Education Committee describing his own struggles as a child with no one to turn to. This two-year-old child who never knew his father, who mother lost him for the situation that she was going through, and there was no one there to support that then and to say in 2023 that there's a chance that that might that could still happen. These children's voices are not being heard and we've got to start listening and not just listening. We have to provide some kind of action that's going to provide them with mental health services sooner rather than later. Included in the list of bills is sponsored by Senator Joseph Cryan that requires school districts to provide grief instruction and another sponsored by Senator Teresa Ruiz that requires the creation of a New Jersey Youth Suicide Prevention Advisory Council. And we've watched with horror recent news in terms of loss in, loss in our schools. Imagine that understanding is what that means to the students that surround. All of it is to to look at what what are we doing, to formulate a report about best practices, what what are we doing, what resources are available. But this is a subject matter that in one committee, I don't think we're going to draw down or get to an answer. It's an unfortunate thing. And so one thing that we need to wrap ourselves around also is outside of creating policy that creates kind of that um, artificial infrastructure for confidence and support and and love is to also remind all of our youth that there are people who are looking out for them and that if they are in need these are the steps that they can reach out to and get opponents of the bills testified saying faith not resources is where funding should go but what's important is that in our civil society for hundreds of years if not thousands of years people have turned to their churches, to their synagogues, um, to their mosques in times of grief, in times of counseling. And to expect that a government employee can somehow fill that gap with a governmentalized grief program, I think it's very disturbing. Parent and school social worker Elizabeth King Quezada testified in support of more grief counseling for students. Quezada stressed to opponents that faith wasn't enough to help her family after the loss of her son who unexpectedly drowned in July. My son passed away unexpectedly in July. Unfortunately, he drowned. My daughter was there at the time. S several of my family members were there. She's currently having difficulty in dealing with it. I mean, she, it, sometimes it becomes behavioral issues. Sometimes it just becomes extreme sadness. Other times you look at her and it's like, hey, you never know anything happened. Children need to be educated on it. Staff members need to be aware of what grief education is and how they can go about talking to children and helping children to cope. And advocates here that I spoke with say it's also important that young children are especially given time, not just resources, to cope with grief. And to see the impact in school and how it's kind of dismissed. You get a couple days, right? Just like at work, you get your, your three-day bereavement and then you're expected to come back business as usual. Not the long-term effect. 
And a lot of these children, especially post-pandemic, are suffering from suppressed grief. Advocates say they're now concerned that if these bills aren't passed, that there could be dark consequences for these kids to safely cope with grief. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Well, bullying has contributed to the rise of those mental health issues. And a decade ago, New Jersey schools enacted some of the toughest anti-bullying laws in the country. But parents and students say the rules don't go far enough, especially in districts where there's little oversight of enforcement. It's a pervasive problem, they say, both in person and online, that's led to devastating consequences. Our mental health writer, Bobby Breyer, is here now to explain. Bobby, it seems like parents, educators, students, they're starting to take this into their own hands just with the rise of bullying. Um, what's the latest right now on uh, what's happening in the state to combat some of these really egregious events? Yeah, Brianna, right now we have uh, a number of parents and advocates saying that more needs to be done uh, statewide, that the laws that are currently in place, which are some of the most stringent uh, laws in anti-bullying in the country, uh, need to be uh, implemented uh, to, to a greater extent. Uh, that bullying is, is way too pervasive. So essentially what's going on in the state legislature now as we speak is that many advocates are, are demanding the state lawmakers to do a lot more. State lawmakers have uh, really responded to that uh, in large numbers by proposing a slew of bills in front of the Senate Education Committee today uh, related to youth suicide prevention in schools as well as grief counseling uh, would be uh, a new class taught or looped in with the current health curriculum, uh, as well as discussing the number of absences that students can get due to mental health reasons. So uh, legislators, uh, legislators are looking at this uh, issue, uh, but, but still a, a lot of pushback from advocates and parents uh, in light of the recent tragedy. Yeah, I mean, of course, a lot of this is stemming from that 14-year-old um, who committed suicide, Adriana Cush, in, in Ocean County after facing severe bullying that was spread online. But the legislature has made a go of this in years past. Are they realizing now that there's still just too much, uh, I guess, uh, autonomy in how these situations are handled? You know, for the legislators that I've spoken with, yes, they I, I believe they are looking into that uh, that issue, especially as it relates to the regulation of things like cyberbullying. Uh, the 2022 uh, amendment to the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act tried to touch upon that. But uh, many of the advocates and lawmakers that I've spoken with uh, said parents uh, and, and community members could do more to regulate uh, social media as it relates to uh, their own teens uh, and what they are posting uh, or chatting about online. Uh, it's certainly a pervasive issue that goes beyond the school day, but that easily goes into in-school measures as well. And so what do you hear both from educators, um, those in the schools and the lawmakers about the role of social media and whose job it is essentially to protect um, people and, and really youth um, and, and youth females, of course, uh, from these sort of dangerous activities? School officials that I've spoken to have, have really mentioned the fact that this needs to be a concerted uh, and team effort between school officials themselves and parents and community members uh, who care for children, whether it's coaches, uh, 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 mentors, uh, things of that nature. Uh, people who, who want to see this issue addressed immediately have really said that this needs to be something that everybody in a community is looking at, not just uh, teachers between the, the school hours and not just parents uh, when they're they're out of school. Uh, so it's something that uh, state officials, uh, advocates, and, and uh, school leaders have said uh, that needs to be addressed uh, quite quickly. Bobby Breyer for us. Bobby, thank you so much for that reporting. Thank you, Brianna. For more of Bobby's reporting on the push to tackle bullying in the Garden State, head to njspotlightnews.org. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, ahead of the governor's budget address, Republican lawmakers are laying out their fiscal vision for New Jersey, and it includes help for schools and property owners. Assembly Minority Leader John DeMeo on Wednesday unveiled a plan that would fully fund New Jersey's schools by using the state's surplus account, which has more than $6 billion in it. Republicans argue about $1 to $2 billion of that money would enable New Jersey to meet school 
equal funding obligations for the first time since 2008 when the formula was set. In return, though, school districts would have to lower property taxes dollar for dollar. Governor Murphy last year increased state education aid by more than half a billion dollars, but it didn't come with a requirement to reduce local property tax levies like the GOP proposal suggests. Turning now to Wall Street, here's a look at how the markets close today. Support for the Business Report provided by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, announcing its renewed Jersey Business Summit and Expo, March 14th and 15th at Harrah's in Atlantic City. Event details online at njchamber.com. And a reminder to catch NJ Business Beat this weekend with Rhonda Schaffler. She talks to the state's chief innovation officer about how the Murphy administration plans to drive New Jersey toward an innovation economy. Watch it Saturday morning at 10 a.m. streaming on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. And finally tonight, it is safe to say the groundhog's prediction about six more weeks of winter, that was more than a little off. We've seen unseasonably warm temperatures, very little snow, and earlier this week, an EF2 tornado in Mercer County. It's mostly linked to a La Nina climate pattern, according to weather experts. But I asked New Jersey State climatologist David Robinson if there are bigger factors at play. He joins me now as part of our ongoing series, Peril and Promise, focusing on the human stories of climate change. David, I don't even know where to begin with this winter weather. To call it an oddity, I guess, would be accurate. But I guess all I can ask is what gives right now? This, this has been one wild winter, uh, a winterless winter in some respects. Uh, but one of great persistence. Uh, we've been warm. Um, we've had enough precipitation, but it's been in the form of rain because it's one of the least snowy winters on record. And then go toss in a couple short-lived cold waves and then a tornado earlier yeah. this week. So, you know, mix it up and throw throw the dice out there and see what's <laughs> going to come up next. <laughs> well, I had to go back and check just to see how rare a February tornado is. It looks like, thanks to all of your data, we've had a few over the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 odd years. Not many, though. So what is that indicative of? We all love to talk about the planet warming um, and how that's affecting weather patterns. But is it? No, nah, it, it's a weather oddity. We've not seen back to 1950. We've not seen a December or January tornado. And this was, if, if the count is right, the fifth February tornado and by far the longest tornado in terms of its track, mm. almost six miles. The others were a half mile or less. So this was uh, just an oddity. And tornadoes are so rare in New Jersey that there's no rhyme or reason. There's no signal in having one or not having one. It just tells us that this week there's been an atmosphere loaded with energy, not just in New Jersey, but across the whole country. But does lack of snow have any factor in in seeing a tornado in February? How much does that play into it, if at all? It's really interesting because there were three tornadoes in February in one day in 1973. And that was our least snowy winter in New Jersey in over a century. But I think it's more coincidence than anything, although it is indicative of how warm it's been this winter, much warmer than the winter of 73. We're going to end with one of the three or four warmest winters on record after the warmest January and probably the fifth warmest February. December was on the cool side. So, yeah, it's somewhat of indicative of it's been warm. There's been a lack of snow. And as such, you've got more of a spring like energy pattern in the atmosphere leading us to a February tornado. Is this what we should expect future winters to look like? If, if you do look ahead, this is indicative of the type of winters we expect in the future. Uh, as the planet warms, as New Jersey warms, 
will become more spring-like as we get towards the end of winter. And, and with that, we might expect these spring-like storms more often. Yeah, my allergies are telling me that's so. David Robinson, thank you so much. And that does it for us tonight. But don't forget to check out Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz tomorrow morning. David kicks off the show with Republican State Senator Declan O'Scanlan on the upcoming budget address and the GOP's priorities. Then analysis of this week's big political stories with a panel of local journalists. Catch it live at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III and the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.